Welcome to the Savvy Ladies Wednesday Wisdom. My name is Lisa Ernst and I'm the Executive Director of Savvy Ladies. Before we get started, a reminder that we'll leave a few minutes at the end of the presentation for your questions. Feel free to type your questions into the chat window. If you're listening to the presentation and have a question, you can send your question to info at SavvyLadies.org. Jill Berndavi is a personal finance coach and longtime friend of Savvy Ladies. Jill specializes in helping women quickly get a hold of their finances and encourages us to change our relationship with money. Jill is also a very new mom, so a special thanks to her today for taking time to join us. Welcome, Jill. Hi, thank you so much, Lisa. So excited to do this again. I did this last year um, just in time for the holidays. I love doing these webinars, so thanks for having me. Great. All right, so let's just dive right in. We're gonna talk about how to break bad money habits in time for the holidays. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're gonna talk about habits today. We're gonna talk about how to um, put some new habits into place. And we're also gonna talk a little bit at the end about willpower, what it is and how you can start to build that muscle for yourself, especially when it comes to your personal finances. So thank you for having me today. I'm really excited. Full disclosure, I have a three month baby on, in a little pouch sleeping on me right now. She's going to be so quiet for us and so excited uh, that she's going to be able to hear this. Maybe she'll learn some stuff by osmosis as well. Your personal finances, you don't have enough. There's never enough. I felt this way. And we'll talk a little bit about how I got here as well. Um, if you feel like you don't know where your money goes, it kind of comes in, it goes out. There's too much month at the end of your money, that kind of thing. Um, you're in the right place if you're dipping into your savings on a regular basis. You know, you you save up a little bit and then you, uh, what I like to call, rob the piggy bank. Um, and you do that often. If you're charging on cards in a way that you, um, you know, you feel like it's more of a habit or more of an impulse, um, you're in the right place. We're going to talk a little bit about how to break some of those personal finance habits. Um, and then there's the emotional aspect of it. You know, so many women that I talk to in my business or my practice, you know, they feel guilty or they feel embarrassed about their, their money situation so much that they don't even talk about it. They feel shame around it. Um, this is for you if you want to start making savings a habit. I'm going to give you some tools, some uh, some very simple changes in mindset that'll help you to um, to build that muscle into making savings a habit. Um, and this, of course, is for you if you're earning a steady income, because we are going to talk about how to manage your cash flow. I would say about um, half of my clients at this point are, you know, they work corporate nine to five jobs. They've got that steady paycheck that comes in that they can count on. So we have tools for that. And then the other half of my practice are people that are self-employed. So their income goes up and down. And we talk um, this that would be outside of this webinar. But I also help people with that as well. And this also is for you if you really want to make a change, because it all starts with the intention. You know, we all have uh, things that bug us and things that bother us. But really, when you set the intention to sincerely change um, and really put this, the habits in place, that's when you're really going to see enormous results. So here's what we're going to cover today. First, we're going to talk about uh, my 90 second daily wealth ritual. Um, it's something that I make all my clients do. And when I share it with people, it really makes a powerful impact on their personal finances. We're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about the habit wheel and how it might be sabotaging you. And so when you understand how your personal finance habits are formed, and you understand exactly how they work, then that's when it gets really exciting. You can use the rules of habit in your favor to start making some powerful changes with your finances. We're gonna talk about uh, the top three common bad money habits that I see. Uh, maybe bad isn't the right word, it's just unhelpful. But working with women since uh, 2008 with their finances, there's certain patterns that I see over and over and over again. And I'm gonna share with you the top three and how you can make some shifts in those areas if you're doing any of those things. And then finally, we're gonna talk about willpower. Um, so who am I and why do I do this? Well, here's a, another picture of me, I think is up here, that's me, um, free baby. Uh, and uh, so I'm Jill and uh, the reason why I help people with their personal finances is because I was in a 
uh, a situation. 2000, back in 2007, I was $30,000 in credit card debt, but only making $29,000 a year in a corporate job. So I was pretty much underwater. And it was, some, it was almost like a shameful secret. I was really embarrassed um, about it. My you know, creditors were calling. I was late on my payments. And no matter what I did, I didn't feel like I could get out of this cycle. And one day I remember very clearly, I got a call from American Express and it was a very threatening phone call. And after I got off the phone, I realized I need to change. I don't know how I'm gonna make changes here, but I have to learn how finance works because I wasn't taught the basic money skills when I was uh, a kid. And I realized that I was basically repeating the same generational money habits that I'd seen my parents do and their parents do. Um, and so I realized that it was time to make a change. And so I started doing two things. First, I started looking at reading everything I could about personal finance, you know, the Susie Orman books and the smart women finish rich and all that stuff. But that was helpful, but I also realized that I had to change my own relationship with money. There were certain habits and there were certain triggers and there were certain emotions that I had attached to money that were repeating these same bad habits over and over again. So when I started to dive into my relationship with money, that's when things really started to change. And then finally, I started getting a hold of, um, getting a hold of my, uh, uh, my cash flow. Oops, went a little too far. Sorry about that. I started getting a hold of my cash flow and I created a budget for myself that um, was really helpful in order for me to see exactly where my money was going at all times. And after 18 months of getting a hold of my finances, doing the inner work of looking at my relationship with money, I was completely debt free. I paid off every cent. Um, and it was a really big milestone for me. And after that, I took the money that I had been putting aside towards debt and I started saving aggressively. And through this process of looking at my relationship with money and putting new habits in place, I was really able to transform my finances and I've never looked back. And so after I started changing my stuff, my sister, of course, from the same family had the same issues. And so she came to me with some issues and I started to help her with her finances. And she suggested that I teach a class. From there, I started teaching classes to women. My first class, I think 10 women showed up. And we spent the day working on personal finances. And from there, my practice was born. People started asking me, well, can you look at my finances privately? And then couples were coming to me and saying, well, can you look at our finances privately? And after doing this for so many years on the side as a part-time thing, I decided I was going to take this full-time. And that's my story as far as becoming a personal finance coach. And I really do this because... There's not a lot of resources out there that are custom, that help people to not only look at the numbers part of it, but also look at the emotional aspect of why they're doing what they're doing. And I just love watching people change their behavior with money, especially with those really small, simple tweaks that we're going to cover today. So that's why I do this. And I'm going to go through this slide one more time. And now we're going to talk about the good stuff. We're going to get into some of these small habits these small rituals that can really set you up for success with your personal finances. This is everything that I'm going to cover today are things that I personally did. And they're also things that I recommend and encourage for my clients. And this is why they get the results that they do. So this is the 90 second daily money ritual that sets you up for wealth. Um, when I first got started, um, I would check my balances daily and when I was getting myself out of debt, I realized I didn't really want to tell people that I was doing that because I thought maybe it sounded like I was obsessive or something. And then I, re I remember uh, about a year ago, I remember seeing an article from the head of LearnVest, um, the CEO of LearnVest, a personal finance site for women, and she endorsed the same behavior. So I felt very validated. It's something that I do when I tell my clients to do. You want to check your balances daily. And it really does take very long. All you want to do is at the top of your day, like right when you're having your coffee, just log into your accounts, log into your checking account, log into your savings account, log into your different credit card balances and accounts. And what this does is this really creates awareness for you. And there are even websites that will consolidate all of this information all at once. I don't really recommend Mint because it makes it a little more confusing. But there, um, there's a site called check.com where you can upload all of your accounts and you can really see exactly where you're at every single day.
And what this does is it creates awareness. If you know exactly how much is in your account at any given time, it makes it a lot more difficult to overspend. A lot of what I teach is about how bad habits grow in the dark. Bad habits grow in the dark. And what I mean by that is that when we're not aware of what's going on, we tend to create a story of what's really going on with our finances without looking at the facts. And we think, oh boy, you know, uh, they, we think, well, you know, I didn't spend that much money or these shoes were only that much money. And then we start creating stories. But when you check numbers daily, it creates an awareness that really frees you up to make better decisions because you're not what I call shadow boxing, which is trying to figure out or try to make up a story about how much you've spent without actually looking at the numbers. So the 90 second ritual has really helped my clients to build this awareness of where their money is actually going. A lot of times we wait way too long. We'll wait two weeks or we'll wait. Oh my gosh, some clients, they don't even look at their credit card bills until they get it in the mail. That's 30 days of purchases that just go under the radar. And then they go through this cycle of being surprised or guilty or shocked or upset at what they see when really what you want to be doing is looking at it on a daily basis. So how do you get started on this today? Um, first, let's see. You want to pick a specific time during your morning. I always recommend doing this in the morning. Do not wait until the end of the night because in the morning, you've got 24 hours ahead of you of good decisions that you could be making if you know the numbers. So you want to pick a specific time during the morning and you want to check in with your money. Let's just do it short. Let's just do a seven day trial for this. You don't have to commit to this for the rest of your life. Just do this for a week and see what happens. And then what I want you to do is I want you to record the results. This is what I have my clients do. Take a look at what happened, what feelings came up, what emotions came up, what changes in behavior did you make over the last week simply because you were completely aware of all of your money. And when you record the results after a week, a lot of times, oh my goodness, let's see, let me go through this again, sorry. Um, when you record it for a week, um, you solidify the, you start to solidify the behavior and you start to see the good things that could come out of it. And that gives you the momentum to continue on for the next week and to keep going with this. I'm telling you, it's one of the best tools out there for being on top of your finances. The other good thing about this tool is that it helps you to uh, it, it helps you to take the emotional charge out of the out of your finances. A lot of times we feel good when the number is up, down. We feel bad when the number is down. But if you're checking in with your money daily, you're creating a relationship. No matter what it looks like, you're constantly in relationship with your finances. And this helps to change the behavior over time. All right, so I want you to try that. Try a 90 second ritual. See what it looks like or what it feels like for you just to check in with your money every day for seven days, no matter what the numbers look like, just being aware. So now let's talk about habits, right? So we're going into the holiday season and a lot of times we're already locked into habits that we've been doing year after year after year with our spending. But when we understand how a habit is formed, when we really break it down into its pieces, then we can make smarter choices and we can start to use this information to our advantage so we can make new habits that really uh, help us with our personal finances instead of hinder us. So let's talk about what makes a habit. Okay, so when we think about, oh my gosh, I have so many bad money habits or whatever and I want to change them, we really have to understand that a habit is a series of three components. The first component is what I call the trigger event. All right, and we're going to get to an example in a second. But the trigger event is the external stimulus. It's the thing outside of us that sets off this trigger behavior. It sets off this series of behaviors that I call a routine. Okay, these are the series of actions that um, comprise the actual habit. And then at the end of the routine, we get a reward. Oh, let's see, these slides are kind of pooping out on us here. Didn't say reward. All right. So at the end of the routine, you're going to get a reward. And that's how we continue the habit because it makes us feel good to do this routine. There's some sort of payoff at the end. So now here is an example of how this would work. This is actually um, uh, a real life example from a past client of mine. I have her permission. Her name is not Sally, however. 
But here's how we started to help her to make changes with her finances um, simply by really taking a look at how her habit was formed. So stressed out Sally um, had a habit of impulsively spending on her cards. But when we really looked deeper, we saw that on days that she was really stressed out at work, let's say her boss said something to her that was uncomfortable or she felt slighted or she had too much work on her plate and she wasn't asking for help, that that was the trigger. So even though she was... Um, even though the final result was spending on her credit cards, the habit actually was formed hours, hours earlier. The habit actually started hours earlier. We really wanted to pay close attention to her triggers. So her trigger was something messed up happened at work, right? And it would cause an emotional response for her. The routine, of course, was at the end of the day, she would make herself feel better by going down the block, going down to Macy's, whatever the store was, and she, the reward would be she would buy herself something. Maybe it was shoes, maybe it was lotion, maybe it was a pair of jewelry, whatever it was. Okay. And when we realized that this, you know, she would beat herself up. She would say, oh my gosh, I can't stop spending. I have so much trouble spending. When we really deconstructed this habit, we were able to see that it, like I said, it started hours before. And so in order to change the habit, for her, we realized that it was really uh, locked. It, it was really a long-term habit. It was really long-term behavior. So in order to change it, we really had to understand this final piece. She had her trigger, she had the routine, she had the reward. And over time, after doing this cycle so many times, she realized that if, the, if somebody said something to her, even in the slightest at work, <laughs> or she got even a little bit stressed out at work, she automatically be thinking about what she was going to buy or what she was going to do right after work. And that's how habits become locked in. You do it once, maybe it'll stick. You do it twice, maybe it'll stick. But over time, if you keep having the same trigger event followed by the same routine, followed by the same reward, over time, all you're going to need is a trigger event for your body or your mind to want to feel that reward instantaneously. And all of a sudden, stressed out day at work and buying something on the credit card become linked. And that's how habits become really ingrained in us. So that's how, it, that's how it can work against us. But if you want to understand how it could work in your favor, knowing this information can help you to change the rules. So what we did for her was now we, we had this great insight. We said, oh, okay, now we get it. When you have an issue at work, it really makes you feel uncomfortable, stressed, whatever it is, it makes you want to go out makes you think of the reward, but what we really want to do is for you to get to the reward without doing the same routine. What you really want here is to feel de-stressed. What you really want to do is feel more relaxed, or what you really want to feel is relief from the tension that you're feeling at work. And so instead of going out and buying something, how can we change your routine? And that was really a fun process. We started to think of all the different ways, all the other ways that she could feel de-stressed, feel more relaxed, feel more pampered, feel more comfortable. Um, and we thought of all kinds of things that were not necessarily free, although some of them were, you know, maybe she could meditate or maybe she could go home and take a bath and maybe she could cook a nice meal for herself. Maybe she could do something that was low cost. Maybe she could do a manicure, pedicure or something like that that would help her to feel, or maybe she could kickbox. That was the other thing we thought of. Um, something that would help her to get the same reward that she was trying to achieve through the shopping without actually using the credit card, right? And so I do this all the time with clients because it's so much more interesting and more fun to be able to think about what you're trying to get from the impulse buy and try to find alternate ways to achieve that end instead of um, instead of racking credit card debt, instead of spending money that you might not necessarily want to be using right now, you want to put towards something else. So that's how you start to change a habit. And here's how I want you to start to think about putting this into practice in the next week for yourself. Once you know the components, you can start to change the rules. So I want you to think of one stubborn money habit that you have. And then I want you to deconstruct it. What's the real trigger? What causes you to do that thing? And be careful because sometimes it happens a week before or, or, or a day before or a couple of hours before you actually do the thing. 
Um, for example, I know for me, when I was in corporate, one of the th things that was always a trigger for me was feeling like I wasn't heard. So if I was starting to, to spend in a certain way, it was really about me having to have a conversation with my boss or a coworker or something like that in order for me to feel heard. And all of a sudden, the impulse to buy something would kind of magically disappear. So think about what is your trigger? And then what's your specific routine? What do you do? What does it look like? What does the behavior look like? And then finally, what's the payoff for you? And then ask yourself, what can I do instead that's going to get the exact same benefit? So this is one of those things that seems so cheesy, but the long-term effects of being creative about how you go about achieving a certain outcome or a certain reward can really make all the difference between um, being on top of your finances and having your money go all over the place. So that's how habit works. And now let's talk about some of the top three, the, the top three habits that I see people make with their finances that are, they're just no-nos. They're, they're not really all that helpful. Um, and again, I've been seeing, watching people's finances and seeing how they behave with their money really up and close, really up and close and personal for the last uh, five or six years. So uh, these are the ones that always float to the top. And I want you to think about if you do any of these things and how you can start to shift these behaviors. All right. Bad habit, uh, money habit number one. Um, oh, it's not showing up here. No. Okay. <laughs> Let me just go back to my notes just to make sure. Um, hmm. All right. Hopefully, I guess it's not going to work. Okay. So bad habit number, uh, number one, there is, uh, the original PowerPoint, there's a graphic of a seesaw. So if you can picture that. And bad habit number one, number, money habit number one is paying too many bills out of one paycheck. All right, so this is where we just get into simple cash flow issues. Um, basically, what usually happens is people, uh, they, uh, they have all their bills due usually around a certain time of the month. Usually it's around the first of the month. And that usually coincides with one paycheck. If you get paid every two weeks, you've got one paycheck, but all your bills are due at the top of the month. And what people tend to do is they pay all their bills out of one paycheck and they leave themselves like $17 in cash for uh, until they get paid again. And then they've got to dip into the credit card to make it toward, uh, make it to the next paycheck. So let's see if these slides work. So here's how it typically works. Um, let me see if these are going to come up. Okay, good. What to do instead. Okay. So what to do instead. So typically what people will do is they'll have all their bills um, due at the top of the month. Oh, boy, these slides aren't working at all. All right. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to improvise here. So... They're all due at the top of the month. And what I encourage people to do instead is to take a look and list out all of your bills and um, put in the first column which ones are the first half of the month and then which ones are the second half of the month. And if you see a literal imbalance, you've got seven on one side and three on the other, then what I want you to do instead is play around with due dates. Most companies will help you or uh, will, will work with you if you say, I want to change my due date to the end of the month or I want to change it to 16th or the 18th. And that way, when you've got the same amount of bills on um, it, basically the same number coming out of every paycheck, you're balancing your cash flow and then you don't have to dip into your savings or put money on a credit card or even worse. My goodness, some people come to me when they do these payday loan things. No, 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 no. A lot of times it's really just an imbalanced cash flow issue. So work with your company companies, call up credit card companies, you know, your cable company, your cell phone company, and ask for a different due date, one that works and balances your cash flow so that you basically are paying the same amount in bills from the first half of the month to the second, from one paycheck to the second. And that will smooth out your cash flow over the course of the 30 days. Okay. Um, and I wish that I had the uh, the visual, but I'm sure you I'm sure you kind of get it. Um, basically, just make a t a t list just like this, and um, and 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 you can sh and you can make changes that way. Um, another quick little tip that I uh, found was really helpful for me um, and also my clients is 
usually the biggest bill that you pay cash flow wise is either your mortgage or your rent payment. And so instead of paying your entire mortgage or uh, rent payment out of one check, what you can do is you can pay half, um, you put half of your rent payment aside in the paycheck that the bill is not due, if that makes sense. So you'd kind of park half of your rent check in a little savings account and then move it back when you need it for that for uh, for the actual payment. And when you do that, then you you relieve yourself of the pressure of having to pay that huge bill out of one paycheck. You're only paying half out of every paycheck. Um, and if you have questions on that, I'm more than happy to clarify. I know it's a little tricky without the visual. So let's see. Bad money habit number two. Oh yeah, none of these are showing up. All right. Bad habit number. Uh, bad money habit number two is looking backwards instead of forwards. And the visual for that was a rear view mirror. So, um, so when when I when people come to me and they have issues with their finances, a lot of times it's because they're opening their bills after 30 days, or they're looking at their checking account after a month or so, and they're looking back on all the charges that they made in the past, and they get very frustrated or they get very upset. How could I have done this? Why did I spend this much? And they beat themselves up about it only to do it again in the next month, only to repeat the same habit. They only look backwards. And what I encourage my clients to do is instead is to look forward. So instead of looking at getting paid, for example, on the 1st of July, and then spending all that money unconsciously for, for the next two weeks, what I encourage my clients to do is to take the day before you get paid and sit down and plan out exactly where those bills are going to go. This works beautifully if you work a nine to five and you've got a steady paycheck and you get the same amount pretty much every week or every two weeks. This is a beautiful system. You sit down the day before you get paid and you plan everything out consciously so that when you get paid on payday, you know exactly what to do for those next two weeks. So what I encourage my clients to do is plan it out the night before. And then once you get paid, once that direct deposit hits, you start paying all those bills, everything that's due in that, that pay period, the week or two weeks that, um, that, that, that paycheck spans, and then just get it all round it all up and get it all done. And when you plan forward that way, then what you're left with is a, is a pot of money that you can do with, that you can spend how you will. And then you'll know exactly what you can spend and what you can't spend because all of your bills have been rounded up and been planned forward instead of paying them as they go along and at the end of two weeks or at the end of a month looking back and saying, my goodness, where did the money go? You want to be more proactive and you want to plan forward and the, the systems and the tools that I teach my clients are very different than how most budgeting systems are because they tend to make you look backwards. The past is over. There's not much you can do about it. So I encourage my clients to look at their finances in a, in a futuristic way, in a proactive way. All right. And now let's talk about uh, bad money habit number three. My guess is that it's not going to show up, but we'll see. Yeah, it won't show up. Um, the picture for that was a stuffed wallet. Bad money habit number three is making money too convenient. Oh my goodness, this is such a big one. Um, sometimes the simplest changes, the simplest, most elegant solutions are like the slap your forehead, duh solutions. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a client and she was like, I don't understand why I keep dipping into my savings account. <laughs> and it was a real issue. She couldn't seem to keep any savings on hand. And we would, I walked her, you know, I asked her some questions, walked her through the behavior and she said something to the effect of, yeah, because, you know, I have my ATM card and I can, you know, I just dip into my savings at any time. And I said, wait, hold on one second. You have a separate ATM card just for your savings account? She said, yes. And I said, do you carry it with you always? She said, yes, always. So the simplest no brainer does solution get rid of the ATM card, leave it at home. Why do you have access to something that you want to keep, that's something you want to save? Why do you have access to your savings account at 3 a.m. after a long night, for example? So sometimes the solutions are so simple and so duh, but they're really effective. So I want you to think about how your money is, uh, if your money is too convenient for you to access. What I encourage my clients to do is to create a fence. And I, of course, there's a picture of a fence here that's 
not coming up. So <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, so what I call a fence, it's really just a way for you to put a fence or a boundary around a portion of your money so that you cannot touch it. Sometimes we spend it just because it's there, just because it's so convenient to get to. So I encourage my clients to do savings accounts, you know, through something like, um, it used to be ING, now it's Capital One. I know HSBC does something similar in Amex. Um, there are accounts where you can put your money aside and it takes three days for you to get the money back. You can't get it back instantaneously if you were to make a withdrawal, but just something, some boundary around a certain portion of your money to make it inconvenient. It's also called set it and forget it, you know, put it away, um, have it come out automatically from your check and then make it inconvenient for you to get to. If you've got credit cards in your wallet and you're keeping all of them all at the same time, that's a way for you to have convenient access to money. And if you're really trying to rein it in, this is really going to work against you. So set yourself up for success and put fences, put some boundaries to distance, I like to say, around um, around how you access your finances. And sometimes, like I said, these are the duh solutions, but they really, really work. So I've had people freeze their credit cards. I've had people have you know, put them in the safe or have other people hold them. Or sometimes just the simple act of taking it out of your overstuffed wallet can be can go a long way because all of a sudden you realize that half the purchases you were making were really just because you could. And if you can't, if you're not able to, uh, then a lot of times your unconscious spending decreases just from that. Final exercise. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about willpower. So willpower is really just getting yourself to do something that's uncomfortable for you to do over and over again. And a lot of times, the reason why we continue to get locked into these habits is because we really focus on the things that we're doing wrong with money. We tend to, and it's not just women, but I tend to work with women mostly, so I see this often, and I do it too, so I get it. But we tend to look at the negative for what we do. We tend to dwell on what we're doing wrong with our finances instead of what we're doing right. And one of the ways that you build willpower is really by building confidence in yourself that you can do certain things well with money. So this is the number one exercise I use this still when I'm trying to do something new, when I'm learning a new habit, or I'm trying to break an old habit, or I'm trying to create something that I wasn't able to create before. It's, let's see if this picture will come up. Uh, it won't. <laughs> it won't. It's a picture of a woman writing in a journal. Uh, the number one exercise is called, uh, to, uh, for willpower, I call it daily acknowledgments, okay? Daily acknowledgments really is a way for you to build a case against that pesky, demanding, um, nagging part of you that tells you all the things that you're doing wrong. Some people call this a success journal. I find that it's just really helpful. What you want to do at the end of the day, especially when you're trying to change your financial habits, at the end of the day, just write down three quick things. Three things that you did well with your money. And if you can't think of three, just do one. And even if it's the smallest, tiniest thing, acknowledge yourself for that. Because that's how you build your willpower. When you actually start to see over time all the things that you're doing right and really acknowledge yourself for what you're doing right, you're more likely to continue building this muscle, building this willpower muscle, and continuing forward because you're giving yourself positive feedback. And not like silly thing, not empty compliments, but really saying to yourself, hey, I took this credit card out of my wallet today. That's an acknowledgement. That's one step in the right direction. I spoke up today at work and relieved some tension, and now I didn't, I didn't feel like shopping at the end of the day. That's an acknowledgement. And the more you do this, the more you practice this, and the more you really write down all of your acknowledgements, you're more likely to stick to your habits long term. And this is for any habit, but I always use this with my clients because I want them to be thinking about what they're doing right so they can acknowledge how far they've come, which solidifies the habit that they're trying or reinforces the habit they're that they're trying to put in place. It's more helpful with their finances. So that's my number one exercise. I use it all the time. I highly endorse it. 
daily acknowledgements. What are you doing right with your money? Even if it's just one thing, and you do that every day for seven days. And I guarantee you over time, it's not just going to be one thing on the list. All of a sudden you're going to have two things and four things and six things. And you're going to realize, wow, I'm really getting on top of my finances here because I have a list of actual events that I've taken. So Congratulations on taking the first steps here. I'm so excited to be able to help you. Um, I want you to take away a couple of things from this. Great finances really comes down uh, to daily habits. And small changes really do have the power to create enormous results over time. That's called leverage. You do these small things, check your finances every day, and all of a sudden, you're more aware than you ever were about with your finances or just taking a checking account, a checking a, ch a check card out of your wallet can have enormous results over time. I really do believe that. And I really do believe you can change anything with baby steps, especially if you're acknowledging yourself along the way. Change doesn't really have to be this huge thing. It's just a series of tiny, uh, small steps and tweaks that produce larger results over time. So thank you so much again for having me here. I'm delighted. This is my favorite topic of all to talk about, how to change your behavior with money, how to change your attitude around money. I really do believe um, that these tiny shifts will help you over time. So thank you so much to Savvy Ladies, and I am open for questions. Thank you, Jill. That was really great. I'm sorry about the about the pictures, but I'm no not worries. I you know I just try to paint the picture for you. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple questions. Um, here's the first one. Yeah. From Maryland, I am trying to pay off credit card debt, but some of the banks are going to try and take funds from my paycheck, even though I've been paying monthly payments. They want mm. large sums of money I do not have. What can I do, and what do I need to do at this point? Mm. I'm, I'm curious why they're, how they're able to take the, like, I assume she's talking about garnishing your wages. I'm curious how that was, how that was arranged in the first place. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's my question. I didn't think you could garnish. It, unless you're the IRS, you know, unless it's the IRS, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about how the arrangement came about that a, a bank would be able to garnish your wages unless you're, you have the same credit card and checking account or something like that through the same bank. I'm not sure. I'm curious how that works. But beyond that, this does, in my gut, feel like a legal issue. And there are certainly um, there are certainly attorneys that you can contact that would help you to navigate this um, a little bit better um, because it, it now sounds like it's moving into more of a contractual legal issue. So right. okay. um, that that would be my answer. Um, and as far as uh, and as far as your mindset around that, just remember that you know, and I, it's difficult when you're in this situation. I've been there when you feel like, you know, you feel powerless or you feel helpless or you feel like you're, uh, not to be you know too dramatic, but almost you feel a little bullied. Um, and, and the mindset piece that I would offer to the to you is to remember that you always do have a choice and you always can be proactive and powerful. You know, what are the you know who can you reach out to that can advocate on your behalf? What letters do you need to write? What phone calls do you need to make? Sometimes just the simple shift from helplessness to even an emotion like anger, I know it sounds crazy, can really help you to move forward. When we feel passive, when we feel helpless, that's when the world starts to kind of close in on us. And I know because I've been there and it was only when I felt powerful enough at least to write a letter or make a phone call, just taking that next step um, can really um, rejuvenate you and re-energize you to, to move forward from this situation. Great. Thanks, Jill. Um, the second question here we have is from Casey. Um, when I shop for family and friends um, Christmas presents, I think my reward must be their happy faces when they open their presents. Mm. I don't want to go crazy this year with my Christmas spending. Any tips for changing my trigger and routine? Mm. That's a great one. That's a great one because that's really, the, I, I love that you've nailed it. That's what your reward is, seeing their happy faces. And so I want you to think about what, what it, what is it really going to take to, to see that, to, to see that result for you? Some people, before they do their holiday spending, they do a list of everybody, um, you know, every, everybody they want to buy for, and they really take the time to consciously, before they enter the store, before they get on Amazon, really take the time to consciously think about what would I really like to give this person? And I think for you, your reward is what would, you would ask yourself, what would really bring a smile to this person's face? And I always advocate 
coming from a place of power where you you decide first this is what i'd like to get this person and this is what i think is really going to put a smile on their face instead of the opposite position where you're in the middle of the store and it's you know the 23rd or whatever of december and you're like i don't know what's going to put a smile on their face and you just buy whatever's in front of you but really being conscious about what you think would bring a smile to their face and then you know putting a dollar to it if you can and looking at all of the different people you want to buy for and just setting up a quick budget for you know how much you want to spend um, usually that is the best way to kind of um, mitigate those last minute purchase those impulse buys uh, while still getting the same reward that you're looking for great thanks um, another question here if you do find yourself in a lot of debt, what is the first, the best first step to move forward? If you haven't already, you want to total everything. You want to total up everything you owe. And I can tell you from experience and from what, personal experience, from my client's experience, for some reason that seems to be the trickiest part. We don't want to know the number because we're afraid if we see the number, we're going to crack into a thousand pieces and our lives are going to be over. But really the first step is to make sure you again, I'm a huge fan of lists, to list out every single account, what exactly the balance is, what the APR is, and just getting that big picture. Here is what I owe. If you need to get yourself a glass of wine, if you need to have a friend next to you to cry to, when this, if it brings up emotional feelings for you, whatever you need to do, but that is the absolute first step. Now, if you already know exactly what it is that you owe, then the next step is to total up everything that you bring in on a monthly basis and just see how much do I have to put towards these bills? How much do I have to put? What's the maximum I could put towards these bills? Um, and then from there, you would piece it out, deciding you know which, which account you're going to tackle first. But if you haven't done it already, total everything you owe and get through that tough part. Cry it out. Do whatever you need to do. And then the next step is to decide how much do I bring in and how much am I going to put towards debt every month and make that decision and write the first check and just move forward. And I did all of that and it's tough. It's a really dark period, but it really empowers you to, um, to, uh, to get out of the cycle when you start taking powerful action. Thanks again, Jill. Um, I think we're about out of time. I want to thank our attendees for some great questions. Thank um, you. Jill, it's really been great. And just remind everybody to go to SavvyLadies.org to look at our future webinars and our upcoming events. Fantastic. Oh, can I tell you about, can I tell them about a, sure. free, a free book? There's a free book on my website, AbundantFinances.com, about how to, um, it really goes more into depth. Um, download it, have at it. People love it. I just want to share that as an extra holiday gift for you guys. Okay, great. And it's at AbundantFinances.com? Yes. Mm-hmm. Great. All right. Thank thanks again, Jill, and have a wonderful holiday. You too. Thanks. Bye.